we are finishing the Ten Commandments today with the Ninth and the Tenth Commandments. So according to Luther's numbering, the Ninth Commandment is you shall not covet. The Tenth Commandment is you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his maidservant or manservant, cattle or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. Before we get to the Ten Commandments, I want to remind you that Pastor Jeremy Maddock is also covering the Ten Commandments in his podcast, Bible Breath. If you haven't heard Pastor Jeremy teach, you should know that he is incredibly gifted at taking really hard concepts and breaking them down into easy to understand bite-sized pieces. So it'll really add a lot to your study of the Ten Commandments if you listen to him. So just check out the episode notes and we'll put a link there to send you right on over. So really, Martin Luther explains that God forbids us to desire or get slash take our neighbor's possessions, wife, spouse, whatever. So the seventh commandment when we talked about it is about stealing, not taking something that isn't ours. This commandment is more about scheming, trying to get something away from somebody and make it look like it's justifiable in our eyes or the eyes of the world. And Luther made a point to say this over and over in his um, large catechism, that the world may look at you as being shrewd if you are able to get something away from somebody. That's just being a good businessman. That's just being, you know, smart. And he says, but God sees. If you have connived to get something from somebody else, if you have schemed, not told them the whole truth, sold them a bill of goods, um, done things to make them think that their land or their property isn't worth that much, and then bought it from them knowing it's worth considerably more, that's just scheming. And God sees it all. And I think there's hope for us, those of us who have been maybe taken advantage of from time to time, and we think, man, I'm just not smart with this stuff. I always, you know, get taken advantage of. God sees. Luther made a point to say that. Really, this is about our hearts. And there's a couple things that I want to bring out. Martin Luther says, it is our natural instinct that no one wants to see someone else have as much as himself. Each one is, acquires as much as he can. And boy, in America, is that not true? I mean, we never seem to have enough. We always want more. We always use what we have only for our own interest. Pastor Mike mentioned recently, I've heard him say twice, once in a sermon and then when I was interviewing him, that the vast majority of people that sit in churches don't give any money to God. And that's kind of a little astounding to me. I I don't know why that's astounding to me, but it kind of is. I guess it's because that's not how I grew up. My parents parents said that they wanted to um, give until they felt it. They always did. And my parents are much bigger givers than I ever have been. But I come from a family that giving to the Lord was just what you did. And um, it's a thank offering, right? So... I was sort of surprised to hear that, but yet on the same token, I'm not because we can easily talk ourselves into there is never enough. I remember specifically talking to a woman that I very much admire, an older woman. And one time she was saying to me, one of her relatives went to Hawaii every year. And she was saying, I suppose I could afford a trip to Hawaii every year if we didn't give anything to the Lord. And then really put it into perspective, that sacrificial giving, that is just an automatic thing. You just give to the Lord. You want your church doors to stay open. You believe in whatever ministry that you're supporting is doing. You want it to continue. So, of course, you're going to give your money there. But, you know, when you start 
thinking, well, what could I do with this money if I kept this money instead? Um, that's maybe eye-opening too. But the fact is, I've never looked at it that way. I don't think God has ever said about me, what could I have done with that um, you know, talent that I gave Amber if I wouldn't have given it to her? Or, you know, I could have spared my son all the pain that he had to go through if he didn't have to suffer and die on the cross. And I absolutely know for certain he doesn't say, hmm, what a pity that I gave sunshine to the farmers or rain to the farmers. He loves to bless us. He he never withholds from us. And when we give, it's just it's just a means of expressing our thanks to him. But Martin Luther is right in saying that our natural instincts, so our natural sinful nature, always wants more. And we always want more than the next person. And so that means that if we're going to not scheme and not covet what other people have, we're going to have to work at that a little bit. And how are we going to do that? I think there's a couple things that we can do. So first of all, one of the things that Luther pointed out is how easy it is to make somebody think that what they have is not valuable. So for instance, if you really want, the example he used is if a man really wanted another person's wife, he might say, you know, things like, she's not that great. I don't know why you keep her around, da, 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 da. The man decides finally to get rid of the wife, at which point the man who was making those comments scoops her up because he was just after her and he just wanted to find a way to get to her. And the way he did that is by making the man think that she wasn't all that great. It's interesting because that actually happens. I see it happening when a man and a woman who work together, for instance, start talking and the wife complains about her husband or something. And this other man, this coworker is like, oh man, I would never treat you like that or whatever. And pretty soon he's making it sound like, you know, her husband is just a stinker. Why do you stay with him? Instead of saying, well, it's probably a bad night or, you know, I, I do some pretty cruddy things to my wife sometimes too. But I've seen it. I've seen people talk about how horrible the other, you know, the spouse is. And then have the two of them get together. I've seen it. So it's, it's, the question is, what are the motives? And as Christians, we should always be building one another up, even when things aren't going very well. So especially when someone's having trouble with their children, someone's having trouble with their spouse. It's easy to point out how terrible that person is at the time. You don't want to see your friend hurt. So much better though, to say, you know, this is a tough season. This isn't, this shouldn't define them. Let's pray our way through it. Let's remember how, you know, how much of a blessing they have been. And let's look ahead to the point when this is in the past and this is behind us. So first things first, we really want to be careful how we talk about other people and their family, neighbors, teachers, pastors, whoever, when we're around other people. Because what we don't want to be doing is coloring them against other people. And I brought up churches. You know, it's so easy to think or to say to somebody, if someone's complaining about their pastor and he never does this or he doesn't allow us to do this or whatever, it's very easy to want to commiserate, right? And be like, wow, that's terrible. I can't imagine being in a church like that. Instead of saying, does he preach the word? Do you hear the pure, unadulterated word of God every week? Do you have access to the means of grace? Does he pray for you? What does he do that he does well? It, it, 
it's a difference in instead of it's okay to let your friends bleed for all by all means we want to have friends who we can rely on and people that we can go to who will listen to us when we have a problem with our spouse our children our pastor whoever but it's also very easy to color someone in a very unpleasant light without knowing the whole situation. And when somebody has been hurt, um, it's very easy, as someone pointed out to me recently, to not be able to think anything good about them. You almost need a wise voice coming alongside you saying, "Uh, maybe you're just seeing the bad. I bet there's some good there. But you might have to ask God for it. You might have to search for it. You might have to have another voice coming alongside you that says, eh, this is maybe not what it looks like. One of the things that um, I think it was Pastor Mike said that he likes to do, this was a year or so ago, but it stuck in my mind, is build people up in front of their spouse. So make sure to say to a woman, hey, your husband really helped me out this week or whatever. Thank you for, you know, sharing him because he was phenomenal. He meant a lot to our ministry this week or whatever. That builds that man up in his wife's eye, wife's eyes. And that's such a good thing to remember to do. To just look, the world is going to tear us down, but we have an opportunity as Christians to build one another up. So instead of scheming to get what our neighbors have, instead of even scheming in such a way to just deviously agree that it's all bad and that the spouse is bad, the children are bad, the situation is bad, the property is bad, you got to get away. Why? Who would want to keep up with that? Blah, 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 blah. Build them up. Encourage them. Find ways to pray for them. Text them that you're praying for them. Second thing that is really important with this is being content, learning contentment. And first of all, I'd pray for it. We prayed for many years as a family that God would give us contentment because it's so easy to keep striving for more and to never be content with what you have. And so we prayed for it as a family. God, help us to be content. Help us to see all the blessings that you give us. Help us to realize how much better we have it than so many other people. And so it is a matter of noticing your blessings and noticing the ways the Lord has been good to you. It's so easy to find fault, but it's a a lot harder to find fault when you notice the blessings and when you are just crazy content. You know, I'm doing this podcast for the second time. First time I did it, my mic didn't work. I sent it in and the, the mic didn't work at all. And I think three months ago or so, I probably would have cried if my producer had texted me and said, Amber, your your mic didn't work and you have to re-record. The fact is, this is the fourth, possibly fifth, fifth podcast that I've re-recorded. Four of them, the mic didn't work. And I can honestly say that at the time I was like, okay, not a problem. It's all good. And I even said to my producer, we jumped on a Zoom call and I said, you know, I I can say that this attitude is from sitting at Pastor Mike's feet for the last several months when he did the Job series. And just recently we did the behind the series interview with Palm Sunday, which is the Hills in the Valley interview or sermon. And it was, are you going to just follow God when things are good? How are you going to respond when things are not good? And he just, Pastor Mike just kept saying, you know, God's worthy. God's good. He's good whether things are good or whether things aren't good, whether your health is good or your health isn't good. And When you can adapt that attitude, it really does take a lot of the stress out of life. I don't deserve any special treatment. None of us do. In fact, if we really want to talk about what we deserve, our sin makes us worthy of no blessings. 
And yet God continually lavishes on us blessing after blessing after blessing, even though we don't deserve it. And so learning to be content, learning to be thankful, and learning to just go with the flow like this, Lord, if this is where you want me, and if this is the situation you want me in, so be it. Even in our brokenness. And that's been something that the Lord has been showing me too. In America, we want our bad situations to go away. We want the brokenness. We want the pain. We want the suffering to go away. Other countries are much better at accepting pain as a part of life. And people tend to pray, God, give me strength. Show me how I can glorify you in the suffering. In America, we just want a pill. We just want something to make the suffering go away. And I've been learning to pray with the Apostle Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul asked God to take the thorn away in his side. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient. I'm not going to take it away. I'm stronger in your weakness. And so I'm learning to pray differently and say, okay, God, then use my brokenness. Use my pain. If it's not going to go away, then use it for your glory. And I'm just going to keep going and it will be what it will be. That's contentment. And that's saying, God, you are omniscient and I trust you. I trust you know what you're doing. And if it was for my good and for the good of your people, you would take this pain away. And if you need to use it, And if you want to use me in this way, I'm content. I took care of the first person I took care of as an elderly companion, lost his ability to speak. And his daughter told me, he was a very godly man. And as he was, as his body was shutting down and he was no longer able to speak and you know, they had to take him out of his house. Then he lived with her for a while. And then he had to go to a nursing home. And what she did get from him is he said, I am content. I'll be cared for and I am content. I trust my life to God. Such a different response than scheming to get your way, to try to prove that God should bless you in a certain way, to try to you know, manipulate the people around you to give you more than you have, what have you. It's really the condition of your heart. And it just removes so much stress from your life when you get to that point. And I only can pray that God keeps me here. I just want to wrap all this up, the Ten Commandments, with just this thought. So Luther concludes by saying, We should really strive for meekness, patience, love towards our enemies, chastity, and kindness. I just wanted to break those down a little bit. So these commandments, Luther says, should actually push us to be more meek, which is quiet and gentle. And I just, I finished a book on this about a year and a half ago. It's going to be published, but not until next year. But we have such a wrong idea of what it means to be gentle and quiet because it doesn't mean that we should keep our mouth shut. It has to do with the attitude of our heart. It has to do with this contentment and accepting God's will for our life, very much the way God showed us through Jesus. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross, but he was willing to go to the cross. He didn't do it quiet in a way that he didn't speak up. In the Garden of of Gethsemane, he did. He spoke up. He prayed more than once for God to deliver him. And But when God said no, he willingly went forward. That's that quiet and gentle spirit is knowing how to weather the storms of life, knowing when to speak up, how to speak up, doing it in a respectful way. It's not sitting in a corner and being quiet. Um, Patience. Patience is the capacity to tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. Again, 
It's that ability to say, I mean, it is what it is. God's in control. And if this is where God wants me, who am I to argue? Love towards our enemies. God is showing me this in a brand new way. This is something I'm learning this year. So most of us don't really think that we have enemies, but if we think about the people who might stand against us or who have hurt us or who get in our way in some way, it really changes everything when you start praying for them, like Jesus told us to, and sincerely praying for them. For God to bring them to repentance, for God to restore their faith in him, whatever. It changes your heart. And it is profound in what it does because it helps you to forgive them in a way that you never have before. Chastity is um, restraining from extramarital sexual relations, um, which again, Luther said, these are some of the things that we should strive for and what a difference that would make in our society. And then kindness is really the tone that you use, the way that you say things. And Linda Buxa, actually in her in her book that came out last summer on the fruit of the spirit, she's the one who reminded me that being kind is telling the truth. Even if it's hard, it's necessary. So kind is not the same as being nice. If you're nice, you're just going to say what people want to hear. But when you're kind, the kindest thing to do is to tell somebody the truth, whether or not they want to hear it. You can do it in such a way that you're doing it, again, with a kind tone, with a loving tone versus a judgmental, condemning tone. And you can do it in such a way that you choose your words so that you're not putting the person down, but you're pointing out what they need to hear. And these are the things that Luther says these commandments should really have us striving for. He also pointed out that It is not about doing great works all over the world as much as it is to take care of our family, to take care of our neighbor, to take care of the people that God puts in our life. He said it's like a girl tending to a child. That is pleasing to God as much as any sacrifice or offering or contribution. Those who fear and love God are going to want to keep these commandments only because God doesn't give these to us to hurt us. We know that he gives us these commandments to bless us. And so if he gives them to us to bless us, why wouldn't we want to obey our Heavenly Father? So when we fear and love God, we want to keep these. And the opposite is also true. Not keeping these commandments and not caring about them really shows that we don't respect God, that we don't care about what he says, which is convicting in and of itself. It had been many years since I had really sat down and studied these commandments. And I have to say, man, there were common pitfalls in every one of them that I hadn't thought about in a long time. So it was good for me to go back through these and really think about them and think about We said I can honor and glorify God by taking these commandments seriously. I hope they did the same for you. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.